Hi, this is Sapil Bharti and we are here at QCon and Cloud20 Con in Atlanta and once again we have with us Rob Hertzfeld, CEO and co-founder of Rag and Rob, it's great to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here and be braving the cold weather here in Atlanta um, and you know, being part of the show and the experience. It was surprising for me also because I heard it was called Hotlanta. So being a cold doesn't make much sense, but we are here. What I love, especially when uh, we are at events talking to you is that you talk to a lot of folks and you bring out the best, you know, not only hot takes, but also the the kind of where the event stands. So I would like to hear from you what has been your impression of the show so far. It's been stunning, right? This is the 10 year anniversary and, you know, I've been to, you know, boy, I think every KubeCon going all the way back to when I was just in a hotel in, uh, in San Francisco. And it's, it's amazing to me to have watched the evolution of the show itself. Um, you know, even just this show, I feel like we keep getting more and more into a community space. You know, they're doing a really nice job building the show floor, not packing it in, not making it feel like we're shouting over everybody, not making it feel like a vendor show, but feel like, you know, there is a community here. It's it's amazing to me, you know, there's a lot of a lot of people who I've I've recognized from my days going way back, but there's a, a lot of new faces. So, you know, we keep bringing in new people, we keep bringing in new capabilities, new vendors uh, show up and turn over, change and that that's been exciting. Um and it's it's huge. It's absolutely, you know, just uh, they they've laid out the floor and it's it's a really stem to stern of the convention hall. Um, you know, just, just you know, a lot of vendors, a lot of names I know, a couple I don't know. It's fun to see. No, you are absolutely right about that. And one thing more uh, is that um, ever since, as you said, 10 years anniversary, from the early days of KubeCon till now, every year or every show, it has a specific theme. But then there is a specific pattern that you keep showing the, seeing the same themes, same topics uh, every year, you know, but time changes. This show, is there anything that you're like, hey, this is totally missing that we have been seeing for the last couple of uh, cube calls, and this is something new that we're seeing? There, there really are waves of things that we see. One of the ones that I, I don't see that was really big a couple of years ago was this whole IDP, the developer portal, a lot of the Terraform and Terraform orchestration, the tacos. Those topics are not as much here this or, or not at all here, right? A lot of the vendors, a lot of the components that they were grabbing a lot of attention two or three years ago really have not been driving uh, conversations in the same way. Same thing with observability. I feel like observability, there was a lot of fights about it and what it is and why we need it. And now it's assumed as part of the stack. So some things sort of disappear. Some things like observability become part of how you do business and they become normalized into that operational pattern. GitOps is the same thing. It's, it's really become normalized. It's amazing to see all of the continuous integration platforms and how much they've been normalized into it. The big gap that we see, and we specialize in bare metal automation, is the infrastructure side of Kubernetes, the ops, has really been missing. You know, we used to spend a lot of time, especially in the early days, how do you install, how do you set it up? What are the, you know, the, the how do you build a control plane? How do you, you know, there's all those questions. That is not here. You know, there's zero talks on bare metal. There's zero talks on the cluster API. There's, you know, only four talks on, you know, Kubevert, which is the VMware replacement virtualization piece. I would expect that to be driving a lot more interest and we're not seeing, you know, there's there's a couple of talks, but it, it's not having the same impact. So the, the groups here are very interested in AI. They're very interested in how I run Kubernetes and what I do on Kubernetes or platform engineering around building Kubernetes. But there isn't a lot of infrastructure discussion. And that to me is an interesting, it's an interesting gap. What I have been like, since the morning, all the interviews, almost 99.9% .9 have been around AI. Yeah. And out of them, most have been around AI and SRE. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, talk a bit about when you walk around, what kind of audience you are interacting with? Is it the same audience, same attendees, same kind of folks? Or you're also seeing difference in the audience as well, which is more geared towards SRE and platform engineering AI. I think you're right. I think the audience that they're, they're expecting to interact with here are SREs who are helping run Kubernetes clusters. They're looking for developers who want to put workloads in. And for that, it's very much on the, the nascent part of how do I train workloads. There is a lot of like, oh, adding, we're adding agents or we're adding AI analysis into things that, I, you know, I think we're very early in those days. And so AI assisted Kubernetes is, you know, marginally valuable and not as much something people plaster all over everything as I would have thought. I had expected to see more you know, AI, whatever, AI this, AI that. And it's there, but it's not the lead here. We're still very much about the func a functional unit of work inside of the Kubernetes ecosystem, right? I need load balancer, I need a better security, I need a pipeline, I need, right? So we're still, and this is the challenge of Kubernetes in general, we have Kubernetes, but then we have this huge landscape of bits and pieces that I have to plug together for it. And, and that is one of the challenges that, I, that we've seen over the years of, you know, Kubernetes is a base and then it's, you know, uh, individual companies solving individual problems. There aren't that many vendors really pulling all those pieces together. I mean, they're at the beginning of the show and they're the biggest names. Um, but for the most part, you know, the people here are all solving point problems inside of Kubernetes. They're not building an integrated answer for you, if they're, unless they're a service provider. Now, when you come to the show, you have a presence in the market, you're solving problems for the customers. Do you see the, the show is kind of a microchasm or reflecting where the industry is heading, where the market is heading, the problems that currently companies, of course, AI is a big thing, you know, or you are seeing there is a little bit of disconnect because more community driven, open source driven. So the focus is more on the SREs or the target audience for Kubernetes. There's a funny thing because the show sells out fast and, and books the sessions really early. And so you don't always get a good sense of where the market's about to be because there's, there's a bit of a lag in a show like a, a show as big as this where they've already filled up a lot of those slots. You know, we we see a bit of that open source component not reflecting the enterprise as much. You know, the enterprise buyers are much more likely to go with a, a name like Red Hat or you know an OpenShift, where a lot of the these questions are actually being prepackaged for them, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. It's one of the things I think is really interesting when people are are using Kubernetes. Very, they're very much in a cloud provider or they're in an enterprise provider. And they're they're not necessarily worried about, you know, how all those pieces and parts fit together. But for for what we see in enterprise, there's a lot of interest in that VMware replacement, in how in what you substitute in. Can Kubernetes substitute VMware? There's a lot of interest strategically, the SREs that we keep talking about are putting a lot of pressure inside the organizations to use Kubernetes more deeply, but they're not getting a lot of ammunition at this show about how to be more enterprise infrastructure replacing Kubernetes. That didn't make the agenda. Um, you know, learning how to run an AI cluster and build an AI cluster and manage the bare metal for you know, AI workloads not on the agenda. Those are, those are really hard challenges that people need to learn how to do. We're spending a lot of time talking about how do I run an inference workload or how do I use uh, Kubernetes to then build an inference infrastructure. That's, those are all important questions, but those are assuming somebody else has done the work and set things up for you. Um, and a lot of enterprises are finding that they're, they have to repatriate those workloads or pull them back or understand how the, those pieces work um, and, and I don't, you know, I don't see those conversations here. I don't see the conversations for the vendors. Um, it's one that we have with customers because we do bare metal and it's such an important piece for us. And it's always significant to me when I see gaps in the vendor conversations or the conference conversations that overlook that operational component. Um, 
And this might not be the show for it, but as the show gets bigger and bigger, it means that the operation side of Kubernetes is sort of being, being hidden away. It's not the topic. What are the topics that are hurting a pain point for either vendors or users that you see are still here? The complexity of Kubernetes and knowing which pieces and parts to pull in is very much a concern. Uh, the, the landscape is absolutely huge. The new projects that are coming in are fighting for mind share. They have to differentiate themselves from capabilities that are already in place. You know, they have to figure out how to get on somebody's menu. If you're an enterprise customer and you're using Kubernetes from one of the clouds or from you know, a major, one of the major distros, then they are curating your experience. And so that's really good if you're an enterprise customer. You don't, you don't want to have to, you know, you don't want five different projects internally competing. At the same time, if, if I have a new way or a new platform, right, or a new, you know, component, how I get in that, that mix is, can be really challenging, which is a lot of what we see here today. It's, you know, people talking about how they solve point problems inside of the Kubernetes ecosystem, and then they're trying to have that conversation. Um, and AI is going to disrupt a lot of that because AI is going to start making recommendations for what people should do or how they should build components. Um, I think even you know the need for a developer portal is diminished because now developers are working inside their IDE and getting prompts and CLI commands. Right, the idea that oh YAML's too confusing or my CLI is too confusing, a lot of that argument is being you know dropped out because I can just ask AI to generate that for me. They don't always know if AI is doing a good job of generating it. That's a whole nother, that's a whole new question that's just emerging. But the level of, oh, I have to learn all these pieces or I have to put tools in front of my developers so they don't have to learn it. That's really up for grabs now. It's a major change. I mean, as we all know, it's 10 years, you know, 2014, 20. 2005, uh, and you also mentioned when it was announced as an anchor project, you were in a room or something like that, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, the Oscar, yeah. Back then, I mean, one thing that COVID taught us was that don't talk about four or five years because the way it disrupted the thing is that, you know, people used to do prediction in 10. I mean, I never ask question, where do you see five or 10 years from now? Because we don't know. And then Kubernetes happened. I mean, even the Docker and everything was slow paced, but, you know, the and then chat GPT, it totally changed the market, you know? So uh, when I look back, I like, we could not have these discussions three years ago before chat GPT came that we are having today. Back then, when you're sitting in the room, it ever occurred that, hey, in 10 years from now, this is where we will be. And though I'm pretty sure that 90% of what you thought did not turn out to be true, but is there an ounce of what you said, hey, this is what will happen and it actually is happening. You know, there was a lot of, a lot of VM versus container um, argument, discussion. Um, you know, there was a lot of, of, it, of idea that containers were going to wipe out VMs and containers were, were just going to replace. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's, it's really funny to me that we are now looking at Kubernetes as the virtualization control plane. Um, and we've sort of flipped the whole argument on its, on its side. And so I, I think that I would have been very resistant, and even two or three years ago, was very resistant to the idea that Kubernetes would be my virtual machine control plane. Um, and so that's been a, a remarkable turnaround. And then watching the virtualization companies, you know, sort of fall into line behind that has been um, a surprising uh, component for how all this stuff would work together. Um, I think the, the one other thing that would have surprised me is how durable the CLI has been. That, you know, I would have expected there to be beautiful UXs and displays and management controls that sort of made everything go away. And the, the persistence of kubectl as the dominant interface in this, I, you know, and, and how much people embrace that, I feel like the, that's a surprising, 
you know, a surprising thing that, you know, the first I was watching Joseph Sandoval and Lockie um, do a demo in on at that that very first OSCON where they were showing. Right. They, they kept doing this uh, alligators demo is hilarious. Um, and it was all cube cuddle commands and, and all those pieces. And I would not have expected that he could probably do that same demo with the same cube cuddle commands today as he was doing uh, 10 years ago. And so that's really remarkable as uh, from a durability of that interface. Rob, once again, thank you so much for joining what? me today. And first of all, give us a great you know, impression on where the event is, where it's not where it's heading, where it came from. And uh, it's hard to say where it's heading, but you know, yeah. it's give us a very good pulse on where it is. And once again, thank you so much. And I look forward to chatting with you again. My pleasure. Thank you.